My name is Marisa Gomez. I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, and there is never a better time to work for the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History than during the month of October. It is our favorite um, for the uh, seasonal impacts that we see on nature, um, but also our staff is particularly fond of being able to engage new audiences um, and engage um, some of the more surprising aspects of nature through our October programming. Um, so why don't you get to use in the chat, get used to that um, by sharing with us what's your favorite part of this season of fall, of autumn. And when you send your chats to us, um, if you don't switch it from saying all panelists um, to all panelists and all attendees, then um, Kathleen and I will see your responses, but no one else will. So, you can just click that little button where it says all panelists, switch it over to all panelists and attendees and everyone can have a chat with each other. Um, but share with us what's your favorite part of autumn in Santa Cruz. Um, so like I said, we love October at the museum and mostly that's because of our annual event, which is called the Museum of the Macabre. And if you've attended our event Museum of the Macabre, let us know in the chat too, what was your fondest memory of that? I have so many. And we're gonna um, explore that event a little bit in today's program too. Uh, and this is actually a kickoff event of what that event is gonna be for us this year. So we're not gonna have our big party like we normally do. This was to be our fifth anniversary of that event, but instead we get to have a month of offerings. And we're kicking it off with today's collections close up, which is specifically for our members. So this is a member exclusive. You guys get the first taste of the macabre um, tonight. So I also wanted to take a moment to, again, as always, thank you for being a member of the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. We are a community run nonprofit organization and we depend entirely on your support and the support of our community um, in order to put on programs like this and to continue to steward our collections and fulfill our mission. And with our doors currently closed, um, your support means more now than ever. So thanks so much um, for being with us. And we hope that you um, enjoy kicking off your October with us tonight. And what we got in store for you is our collections manager, Kathleen Aston, is going to uh, walk us through the history of the curious trend of curiosity cabinets. And we're also going to explore how our museums, uh, our institution is rooted in that trend, as well as think of more modern takes. Um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome in Kathleen. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, good answers in the chat. I can't disagree with any of those. Um, and I'm very excited for our, our Halloween lineup this year. I was a little bit, um, always been sad about missing Macabre since we realized it was going to happen, but everything that's uh, going on is so exciting. Marisa, you put together such a great set of things that I'm thrilled for it. Can't wait. Yeah. Okay. So um, just to jump right in, let me just share my screen here. Okay. All right, are we seeing this incredibly gorgeous engraving? Gorgeous. Okay, awesome. So um, in case any of you guys want to, let's just take a moment to drink this in. This is probably one of the earliest known engravings of a curiosity cabinet or collection of curios um, that are in some ways the roots of modern museums or part of those roots. And um, if you guys wanna put in the chat just anything that jumps out at you here, um, anything that you would find yourself like wildly pointing to, like these actors in the engraving or like these characters? I'm looking down. Like it looks like there's some little like toy lions. <laughs> what are those? Or tiny <laughs> dogs. Um, tiny dogs. Yeah, most of the descriptions of this collection actually involve um, a like extensive list of all the things that are like hanging everywhere and like cupboarded and closeted there, um, but not actually the dogs or the individual people from what I've seen. Um, but you'll notice uh, that there's like books, um, there's people coming to look at these things, there's um, taxidermy, you know, animals, there's shells, there's birds. Um, and there's a lot really to like sort of ask questions about. Um, and so I wanted to ground this history a little bit more in this notion of what is a 
a curio and how does it relate to these like thinking about objects as having that kind of status is something that anchors curiosity. Um, and you'll see that like from this, you know, etymology, um, it's a piece of bric-a-brac from the Far East, um, which sort of relates to this larger history of colonialism we'll also talk about, and a shortening of this, you know, curiosity or an object of interest from the 1640s, um, which was then, you know, extended by the 1890s into like a broader sense of interest. Um, and so we'll sort of, you know, go back and forth along this like tension between, you know, how things were, um, objects were related to early on in the history of museums and how oftentimes we keep coming back to, you know, this fundamental sense of curiosity and what it means for how we engage with and display things today. Um, so I wanted also to, so we're looking at some sort of the more iconic uh, curio cabinets of the, in the history of the phenomenon. Um, and this one, um, so the last one belonged to, uh, Neapolitan uh, apothecary named Ferrante and Pro, and that was from 1599. Um, so the phenomena of curiosity cabinets really extends back into um, the you know 15th and 16th centuries. You're getting objects, specimens, artifacts, unknown uh, items from all over the world are starting to come into Europe. Um, uh, you know, at, at the uh, brought by colonial ambitions um, and often rooted in um, a lot of, you know, exploratory practices that in some ways were really, you know, admirable for how they learned and in some ways also really sort of obscure the conditions in which they were um, obtained. And that is another question that we'll keep coming to as we look at how we relate to these objects now. Um, but this is a, a Danish, the Museum Bormanium, and I'm also not able to pronounce uh, a number of the names that we're gonna see in this slideshow, so please forgive me for that. Um, and this is his uh, uh, Danish physician's uh, collection um, it, named Ole Vorm from 1655. Um, and again, we see just like an incredible scope of objects. Um, and if you look at a lot of the arrangements, it's totally different from the previous engraving. Um, today, one of the things that we really think of when we think about museums is how things are like organized, um, especially from a collections perspective but also from an exhibit's perspective. And the emphasis on these early curio cabinets where they had these sort of eclectic, encyclopedic, immersive experiential collections um, was really a sort of idiosyncratic sense of ordering the world around you, um, of like identifying relations that weren't really yet influenced by like consistent notions of science, for example, because those didn't exist as they do now. Um, and you see that both of these like curio cabinets as we're calling them or curiosity cabinets I often shorten it, um, have been whole rooms. Um, but there were a number of different words, words to describe this phenomenon. One that eventually sort of settled on the notion of a museum, but things like studiolo um, or, uh, you know, uh, Wunderkammer or Kunstkammer, so like in German, wonder room of wonders or wonder room um, or Kunstkammer, art room. And that's something that you also see here. There was also the integration of like paintings and sculptures alongside natural history specimens, um, coins from classical antiquity. So people were really combining all of these sorts of things. And so you have these expansive rooms, but you also have these smaller studios and private or semi-private homes. Um, whereas like, you know, time went on and you're getting more towards the 1700s, people have leisure time and want to learn who aren't necessarily people who have these big expansive sort of the scope of royalty um, or royal patronage to support them, but they're still using these objects, arranging them as they see fit and integrating sort of what we would now see as like completely separate disciplines together. Also, I really love the seahorse that's hanging up there on the wall. Um, here you see a curiosity cabinet, not as like a room or like a studio, but as an actual cabinet. Um, and another thing that you see here is the like extensive variety of materials. Um, you also see a lot of like tools and objects of study and science. Um, and this is and this is a painting that we love to use because it's one of the more colorful depictions of curiosity cabinets. Um, and it also, you know, relates to um, the incredible breadth of the forms that these things can take. And the way that in, as time went on, people were sort of thinking about them as um, ways both to like immerse oneself in like an environment of learning from these objects, but also ways to like encapsulate and contain um, a set of objects for learning about a particular subject. Um, so we'll, and, but these were all sort of, you know, this history is kind of going in a direction of time, but these were all, you know, trends that were happening um, on different timescales and in different, ways throughout Europe. Um, we have one of, this is my favorite. Um, so this is the uh, 
Theater of Natural Wonders of a Dutchman named Levinus Vincent. Um, and here is where you see a great example of like not just like a single room that one person was engaging with or a couple of people were being hosted by, you know, like an individual, perhaps high society person. Um, but you have a whole bunch of people coming and going and some having conversations, um, some touching things, some looking at things. Another, and this, you know, again, is just another version of what the curiosity cabinet came to mean, which was not just a room or um, like a cabinet or a studio, but a place where people were engaging in the study of sets of objects. Um, another thing that you can kind of see here is people are like leaning on things and walking around and like early understandings of museums really had, you know, people able to just go and pick up and grab and touch things. Um, which, if you guys have been to a Museum of the Macabre, we often spend, Maurice is laughing, because we spend some time uh, every year talking about like, okay, how do we make these things exciting for people? How do we present this um, interesting, engaging relationship without anybody touching anything? Um, and that's like a challenge that is um, important, and we have a lot of reasons why we do that, but it's also a very modern feature of museums. These early museum worlds um, were very much about like touch, smell, um, I want to say taste, uh, which is related to an anecdote of uh, geologists being able to taste rocks to tell the difference between certain kinds of specimens, um, which we can get into more later, but it was just this really rich sensory experience. Um, and, you know, these are, um, uh, this particular collection also uh, illustrated a different orientation that we haven't talked about yet about these early cabinets, which was a sort of religious reverence. Um, Lavinus Vincent in particular was really passionate about trying to like create this encyclopedic collection that would mirror God's creation and be able to reproduce by like effectively collecting all of these objects and understanding them and organizing them the right way, trying to like reproduce a purer sense of like the natural world that God created than what we're wandering around in now. Um, and so that was like you know, and, and his, uh, so this is, puts us at about the early 1700s is when we're looking at a collection like this. Um, and there were, you know, files of animal cadavers and 288 boxes of insects and 32 drawers of shells and crustaceans and just um, so like an incredible scope of everything. And it was just like for people to just like wander up and pull things out of and take a look. Yeah, um, I wonder, um, in the picture on the right, it does look like things have been kind of like thrown about, like that image is um, not right side up. And is that meant to like kind of nod to how people would engage with these specimens? Definitely. Um, it, it was really this notion that like people were able to actually come and like touch them. Now, this is still a certain, a period of time where um, when you're looking at like who people is and who the public are, that notion has always changed. Um, and so, you know, it was often going to be like um, white upper middle class men who were engaging with these collections, but nonetheless, it was like an aura of like, pull this out, touch this, take this piece. Um, and there's also what this, um, uh, what these engravings are actually from is a catalog that was published describing all the contents of the collection. So this is around a period of time, um, you're getting, you know, an increase in print technologies as well. So people are like circulating catalogs of their collections. Uh, which is another, you know, thing that we want to mention too that I hadn't gotten to before, but all, all of the time while people were doing this, they were engaging in curiosity for themselves. They were to varying extents sharing that with other people, but they were also treating these objects um, of, of prestige as objects of prestige um, and being like, you know, I am someone who knows these things and who has like the um, sway in society to gather them and gather these people into myself. So, uh, which is a great question. Um, so this is uh, another really exciting period in the history of like curiosity and display of the natural world. Um, these are the dioramas of Dutch anatomist, Frederick Roosh, um, who was alive from the mid 1600s to the mid 1700s. Um, and he was uh, really interested in, he was, you know, it's part of a trend towards like more um, medical discoveries and more preservation technologies. And he was a big fan of doing public demonstrations of like surgery and things like this. Um, and then he would take a lot of the pieces of these things that he was working with in his surgeries or other cadavers and then create these dioramas out of them. Um, was the, the original 
like reason for the um, demonstration of surgery meant to be educational or was it meant to be similarly macabre to what we're seeing in these displays here? So that's an, I, that's an interesting question. I would say neither of these was actually meant to be macabre. Um, uh, the sort of anatomist people were, um, there was this sort of building notion of like, for, like science and trades, scientific like professions going from like trade type things to like more like formalized professions. And so there would be like groups of people who would get together and like share their craft, whether that would be like an anatomist and surgery. Um, or like physics demonstrations and things like this. There's some really great physics curiosity cabinets from the same period of time. Um, and these were, although they would seem macabre to us, and one thing that doesn't really come well across is that um, these are, you know, um, the skeletons of like fetuses in some cases or babies. Um, and then a lot of the sort of botanical elements in his displays were actually pieces of people's intestines um, that he would then take and like arrange as if they were like leaves or flowers after he preserved them by experimenting on preservation techniques. Um, and they were definitely, yeah, they're wild. Um, and they were definitely meant to be not macabre, but more sort of like moral plays um, and, and theaters with like stories um, and a narrative arc to them. So that's how they were like generally meant to be read. Um, but we also do see like, you know, at this time people are doing things that are also very um, meant to be very sensational. Um, so people are like sewing like a monkey to a fish um, and then preserving it with these newer tech, taxidermy technologies and then saying that it's a mermaid. Um, so you have these sort of like one of the first iterations of what I think we later then would call um, sideshow taxidermy, which is something we talked about in the Museum of the Macabre a couple of years ago. Um, and then at the same time, you also have, you know, you, you have like thinking about moral lessons and things that are um, macabre. There's also, you know, a lot of things in this time period where people were taking, you know, uh, other people's like aspects of people's like sacred culture, or other bodies that weren't valued as much as maybe Europeans and putting them on display in a way that didn't really accord them the amount of, you know, dignity and respect that we now want to be giving these things. Um, so that is sort of, and that again, we're seeing this trend more towards like uh, public engagement with these kinds of displays like um, his collections would be in like different drawing rooms throughout Amsterdam where people he would like move them around sometime and give people the opportunity to come view them um, and then in the late 1700s which is when this naturalist pocket magazine is from um, you're seeing also the opening of a lot of these like smaller collections from different uh, curio cabinets um, across Europe especially like royal collections in places like Russia or Italy are all of a sudden now opening to the public um, but you're still seeing like different, you know, the, the notion of something being a cabinet of curiosities could also be a book, for example, like this one, um, where, you know, people are, are interested in making knowledge about the natural world um, and other things as well, like accessible um, in like a book form that could then perform some of the same functions of learning as being able to go to these physical spaces. Um, and so we... Um, sort of see as that sort of like trend toward like the public engagement and public learning aspect is like starting to happen. These things are becoming more open and being considered a public good. Um, we also see individual collectors like Hans Sloan, um, who gave over 71,000 items to um, the nation of England uh, that became what is now mostly the, the British Natural History Museum. Um, and then uh, James Smithson, um, whose collection was left to the United States and became the Smithsonian. Um, and these are, you know, scientists or physicians and people who are like um, professionalizing their craft. We're seeing like the professionalization of sciences at this time. This is sort of like the late 1800s, um, the mid to late 1800s and the early 1900s. And we're also seeing um, the professionalization of museums. And so people are like, okay, there's a rational world out here. Science organizes it like this. And we need to mirror those organizational systems in our museums in order for people to be educated and to learn about things. And, um, you know, here around this time, I think it was around 1891, you have this um, Norwegian museum uh, director goes and travels throughout different museums in Britain. Um, and he comes away with this 
great emphasis that he saw on forcing visitors not to just like look at things and be curious, but to learn something. And then he goes home to Norway and like is like, hey guys, you have to rewrite all of our exhibit labels and make sure that this is about things people can learn, not just things people are gonna look at and say, hey, that's cool. Um, and then, you know, and that sort of as you get more towards the Victorian era, so like 1830-ish um, to, you know, the very early 20th century, um, you get people wanting to be able to take that kind of learning in the, into their own homes um, and also able to do so because there's like a rising middle class. Um, some people have more leisure time and they also want to seem like they are, you know, um, studious um, and, and have the kind of prestige that before was only uh, available to these wealthier people um, and to people who had wealthy patrons. And so you see another version of a cabinet, the ladies floral cabinet. Um, which is a pictorial home companion about flowers um, for Victorian ladies to be able to read and engage with at home. Uh, which is, you know, there's a lot of these different texts are digitized and available in the Biodiversity Heritage Library, which we love and we have, I think, some links to for the end of this talk. Um, and, you know, so time goes on um, and museums continue to develop, but they also continue to return to this trend of curiosity and like this sense of like, um, rich and like specimen dense splendor of the natural world, although we organize it differently now. Um, but you're looking here at the main gallery or the foyer of the British Natural History Museum, which, you know, some years ago put together a specific exhibit to honor the sort of naturalist history um, of their museum and like these collectors. So someone like Mary Anning, um, you know, gets like a, a special exhibit um, and then you have, you know, like different like uh, you know, even the ceiling of the museum is really well known for having individual panels that represent, you know, particularly important things throughout the history of, of collecting in the Natural History Museum. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting about this is, and we'll include this article um, as well in the resources that we're going to give out, um, two authors who work in the British Museum looked at the histories of how um, colonialism and scientific racism are like are or are not talked about in exhibits like this one at the Natural History Museum and give a really eye-opening understanding of what it means for people to come and like see specimens that they know are related to their histories or that they might not have that chance to know yet and how that affects their engagement with science in the natural world um, and how you know calling out and talking about those histories is an important part of like opening up the engagement of you know the engagement with nature through the lens of museums to as many people as possible um, which is pretty cool. Um, so, and that is, and also, I'm not seeing the chat, Marisa, so if you wanted to send any questions my way, I'm happy to expand on any of this stuff. This is like one of my favorite topics ever. Um, so I'm happy to expand on any of this stuff in like questions later. Um, but we do also want to talk about the history of our very own museum and how it relates to this history of curiosity um, and display and engagement with the natural world. And so this is the Hecox collection um, at the Lighthouse in the 1880s. Um, and if any of you are um, new uh, to the Laura Hecox story, she's our foundational collector. She was born in 1854, so um, in the early stages of the Victorian era. Um, and when she was 14, so she's still a kid, she moved into the lighthouse um, here in Santa Cruz. Her father was the first keeper um, and spent her childhood wandering the rocks and shores of the lighthouse collecting objects. She later became keeper um, and would give, you know, required public tours of the lighthouse spiced up with the added addition of her museum collection. Um, so, and we see that when people are talking about her museum collection, they're talking about um, things that have both, you know, the fascinating collections of shells and curiosity, an exhibit of skeletons, seabirds, and curios, um, natural history specimens that then inspire people to want to learn more about natural history from books when the museum was briefly in the library. Um, and so we, the reason I bring this up is because oftentimes, you know, we're a natural history museum and Laura Hecox is our founding collector and she had, was a naturalist, um, but she also was so much more. Um, and we have this like long history of museums um, having origins that are like more complex and nuanced than sometimes the stories we get to tell in modern day. Um, and so, you know, we wanted to talk a little bit today about like the parts of the Laura Hecox collection that we don't normally get to engage with, um, you know, because they don't necessarily fit into our concept of what connecting people to science and nature means now, contemporarily. Um, and we do, I did also want to talk about how I think it's really cute uh, in the history 
of the Hecox collection, how uh, as the, um, her collection was being organized uh, before it was given to um, the city of Santa Cruz uh, to be a public museum in 1905, there are little updating articles in the newspaper about you know, people needing to finish the cabinets for it and how everyone was so excited and about how she and her mom were working to organize everything. Um, and, and you know, the, the care and the um, amount of energy that was put into the creating of cases and the creating of a system of organization is really important here. Um, as it was in early curio cabinets, but now it has this bigger sense of systemize, systemi systematization, system we'll pause on that one. Um, thought Marisa was going to lean forward and say the word correctly, but don't worry. Um, anyway, so this greater emphasis on, you know, like making sure that you are like reaching out and educating people about like what science is and how it can be used as a tool to see the world. Um, and Laura was really interested in that. This is um, an article she clipped in her scrapbook where she is um, answering a query to the newspaper about how red sea eggs are not actually mysterious eggs of the sea. They're actually the bodies of sea urchins. And you know, she's you know, talking about not only is this something she wants to tell people about, but it's something she's willing to trade people about so they themselves can collect and learn things um, about the natural world in this way. So that is, sort of a grounding in this history of our museum within these larger trends of you know um, people collecting things to learn about the world um, to educate themselves interested in education as a public good um, and interested in like organizing things in this more systematic scientific way um, but we also in the Laura Hecox collection have a number of objects um, that were in that was sort of in this curios category that we don't often get to talk about. Um, and so we wanted to present some of them to you guys here today. Um, and we're just gonna go through, there's a, a variety of items to look at. Um, and I have put sort of an organizational lens of my own on them today um, as part of just the way we're interpreting this collection right now. But one of the things that's so cool about having you know, um, a variable collection is getting to look at it through these different lenses at different times um, and getting to see how that, you know, connects to how we're understanding the world around us now. Um, so, oh, and I was going to say, we definitely rely constantly on this um, aesthetic of curiosity um, and dig deep into this trend, like that picture of the natural, the British Natural History Museum from earlier. This is Marisa and I at the Santa Cruz County History Fair um, two years ago now, I think, maybe three. Yeah, something like that. One and a half. I don't know. And that was the first time that I had like worked with Marisa doing front public facing work. Um, I love these events with y'all, but oftentimes I'm mostly just downstairs in the collections uh, doing things behind closed doors. Um, and it was really interesting. You know, these are stories that I love and an aesthetic that I personally love. And then getting to watch Marisa do her work of like getting people excited about this person who was so excited about the world around her and how we engage with nature um, through that sense of curiosity. And that was so much fun to um, to get to put together the dis display with Kathleen because we both do share a similar aesthetic and so getting to um, this is one of the, the more fun parts of the job because it is very much a visual um, medium exhibits um, and so yeah, which I'm excited that we're going to dig into a little bit later here, especially with Marisa having taken the lead on so many macabre events. Um, well, and when I say that, we all, uh, as a staff, like, collaborate pretty heavily on those because we're all pretty into it. Um, anyway, so some curios from the Laura Hecox collection. And these things, we don't have a lot of information about how these would have been displayed. Um, they are part of our... Um, you know, heritage with her collection, but her collection, you know, as some of you who were here with us in August, went through sort of a circuitous route to get to where it is today in the museum. Um, and documentation, you know, was like redone and organization was shifted here and there. So that's also part of why I've made sort of my own selection. So um, we're looking here at a couple of different things that I think are interesting because they're artistic rendition, renditions um, of like natural objects or making art with natural objects. So we have these like engraved pieces of a chambered nautilus shell, a butterfly wing of, of spun glass, um, a peach, a carved peach stone in the shape of a monkey. There was also one in the shape of a basket. And it's really interesting to think about like Laura Hecox was like a very um, 
you know, she was beloved, but from a lot, you know, she, she wasn't necessarily the most like talkative or chatty person. She was somewhat reserved, it seems like. Um, and just to think about how, you know, and she really cared about taking meticulous notes and organizing things um, in her natural history collections. And so it really makes me wonder how she would have organized these objects within her own displays. Um, this is another set of objects that I really enjoy because she was something of a shipwreck collector, um, which some of you who might have um, come to previous uh, from the vaults might have seen a couple of these objects. Um, one of these is a piece from the um, Schooner Active um, that crashed off the lighthouse in Santa Cruz when Laura was like, you know, a young woman. Um, and she got a couple different pieces of that particular shipwreck. But then we also have um, a cigar case of some kind that was made from a ship um, that was, you know, that lay beneath the waves 300 years and that was raised in 1840, which was 14 years before Laura was born. Um, so sometimes looking at these labels is an interesting exercise in thinking about like how, you know, stories about objects are transmuted and then what meaning you take from them after that. Um, because as you can see, for example, this worm-eaten piece of wood um, is a fragment of a ship that was supposedly what Napoleon used to escape exile on the island of Elba. Um, but we actually know because the state has, you know, documentation of like the um, shipwreck archaeological heritage off the coast of California, that this was actually a ship that a lot of people thought was Napoleon's ship, but absolutely was not. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting, I've always enjoyed that story. Um, we also see a lot of tools. Um, we talked about how like people had different sort of like tools and measuring systems and stuff throughout time in like curi curiosity cabinets. Um, and so we have this incredible cloven hoof letter opener um, that is a big favorite with the collections department. Um, we have a small spyglass, which is exciting to think about, you know, whether this was an object of personal use or Either of these were an object of personal use for Laura. Um, we have, you know, part of a Mexican spur. It's a little bit more um, like, you know, a work oriented tool. Um, and there, these are just, again, this is kind of the tip of the iceberg. There's a number of other objects um, in different ways, probably, to categorize and organize them. Um, we have sort of, this is kind of me thinking about different like religious orientations to objects. Laura was a very religious woman, um, as her father had been. She was, uh, you know, pretty committed to um, the temperance movement and a couple of other things like this. And so we have this like olive wood bead that's carved from the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem. Um, and then these are nails from a mission. And there were a number of different objects, you know, that were collected from missions. And so whether that's a religious orientation or historical or otherwise, that's also sort of open to thinking about. Um, and then also just like broadly speaking, we have a bunch of different historical objects. Um, and that includes uh, you know, things that are from antiquity, allegedly. So like a fragment of the pavement from Pompeii. Um, and so some of these are, you know, this one from the records looks like it, the collector, whoever gave it to Laura was like, oh, I picked this up on a trip. But there are also some objects that, you know, are allegedly from thousands of years ago um, that are also, you know, from antiquity, antiquity. Um, and then you have something like this piece of wood and you can see that it, it is a bullet, uh, got lodged into a tree and then when someone was cutting the tree they like found this piece and made a slice out of it and brought it as like an object of, of curiosity or interest um, that ended up in Laura's collection. Um, so there's a lot of different things that are in Laura's collection and we do also want to acknowledge so in addition to these other categories of things that we have um, you know historical curio tool unknown there's you know fragments of different things that don't have documentation um she also collected a number of objects that we would now sort of put in like an ethnographic category so these are objects that were collected or purchased or stolen um, from indigenous communities um, in what is now the united states and a variety of other places um, so we do want to acknowledge that both in the hecox collection and elsewhere in other parts of our collection we do have collections that are objects um, and items that are relevant to um, regulations like the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Um, and we have, in fact, repatriated human remains from an object that were originally that was originally part of the Hecox collection. Um, so this is a really big subject and probably too big for talking about in this talk here today, but we did want to, you know, be, we want to acknowledge this. We're striving to improve our stewardship of these collections. We want to be collaborating with our source communities as to what their future will be. Um, and to sort of challenge like the aspects of like the, the legacies of injustice that parts of our collections present. Um, so yeah, big subject, happy to talk about it more. Um, and of course, you know, 
beyond the Hecox collection, as I mentioned. Um, well, we have been collecting, you know, a lot in the years since then. Um, but this is another one of my favorite sort of like holistic collections um, that itself was on display elsewhere in Santa Cruz for a number of years. Um, it's a collection belonging to a, um, a man, oh gosh, I believe his name was Ronald Reed, um, dating back to the 1800s. Uh, and uh, it was collected in part uh, by us in the 80s because of this interest in it having been a collection that itself was on display for a number of years. Um, and the front and center beauty in this uh, slide, which I really wanted to share with you guys, is a hairball from the stomach of a cow. Um, not going to lie, as soon as I realized we were going to do this subject for collections close-up, I was like, it's finally time for the cow hairball to get its rightful glory. Um, so we can talk more about that if you guys want to, but I know when we were prepping this presentation, Marisa said, ew, gross, don't ever show that to me again. So we'll move off of it now. No, 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 this one's okay. I didn't quite understand how this could possibly be a hairball. So Kathleen shared with me further resources to illustrate how this could be a hairball. And that was that you don't ever show that to me again. Oh, okay. So if you want to, if you're curious about how this could possibly be a, a hairball, we're not sharing that resource with you, but you can see <laughs> Um, and I do also, you know, what we love to see here, these, uh, what would maybe once have been alleged red sea eggs up here in the top right corner, which are a type of urchin um, body. Uh, and then, you know, so when we collect now, um, what we're more interested in collecting, you know, we've got limited space and resources, and we have so many people who are interested in like, you know, being engaged with this process of understanding the world through collecting. Um, we get a lot of inquiries and a lot of offers, and we wish we could say yes to all of them, but we can't. Um, but some things that we do say yes to, in addition to things that we know are, you know, scientifically relevant um, or have like a good data um, about like their collection uh, are, you know, we also like to collect sets of objects that demonstrate, you know, someone was taking care to organize and to systematically represent, you know, a way of learning about the natural world. So whether that's like a chest of eggs, you know, from a local judge who grew up and started collecting as a young boy in the British Isles or a set of uh, geology specimens that were gathered and organized by a woman's grandparents who, you know, they would make her and her siblings get a rock on trips all of the time and fit them into like this puzzle piece of different specimens that they gathered um, to, you know, a woman who gave us her father's set of butterfly specimens, which definitely have, um, you know, their well preserved even in these cigar boxes and they have identifying species information but unfortunately no location collection information but we love to use these collections as ways to engage people with this aesthetic of curiosity and richness and like specimen dense like organized displays um, and with that i will hand the mic over to marisa to talk about oh wait actually we're going to talk about something else a little bit first, um, but Marisa is going to be involved in this because it was a recent event in the life of the museum. Um, for those of you who read the collections close up this month, um, the blog, which just came out this morning. Um, yeah, this morning. Um, so you might not have had time, but it's the story of a gentleman named Ray Bandar. Um, who was really good at sort of balancing this notion, this, this compelling aesthetic of the natural world, um, the beauty and the science at the same time. Um, and that's sort of what we're thinking about when we're looking at like, okay, we'll, we'll get this collection of good looking butterflies, even if it doesn't have scientific data, if we think that we can use it to be a compelling, compelling exhibits piece, and if we have the space for it, um, or a compelling uh, engagement piece. Um, and so Ray Bandar was, uh, from a very young age, uh, uh, an extensive collector. You can see um, the, all the skulls surrounding him in um, the Bone Palace, which is what he called his home in San Francisco for many years. Um, it took him a lot of time to collect these specimens. And for over 60 years, um, he was a field associate at the California Academy of Sciences, um, where he was super passionate about the sculptural beauty of skeletons um, and also like the practice of contributing to science by collecting them. Um, and so he was a volunteer who would be, you know, constantly on call um, on the coast of California, um, but also would go on some research expeditions to help, you know, um, collect 
oftentimes the skulls of specimens, collect data about them, um, take them through the process of, from death to display of, you know, stripping off the flesh, of, you know, macerating the specimens to get the remaining scraps to go away, figuring out how to display them, and then to engage people. Um, Ray was a, a big fan of Halloween as well, just like our museum staff, and was a constant fixture at Cal Academy doing outreach with different specimens from his collection, but um, especially excited about like Halloween and the sort of like spooky aspects of these specimens he found to be so beautiful. Um, so he passed away a couple years ago after, you know, again, decades of public service to the Academy um, and the California Academy of Sciences what, um, took most of his collection um, which had been gathered specifically under permit with Cal Academy. So, you know, Ray was doing everything above board um, and consistent with the legal regulations and ethical regulations of collecting. Um, so most of his like data rich specimens went to Cal Academy, but then they had a number of sort of um, like uh, interesting, uh, compelling specimens that might not have had a lot of specimen rich or data rich um, qualities to them, but were definitely like something that could be used to engage the public and they chose to share that with local science organizations like us um, and Marisa uh, and you can see here um, Liz from visitor services or our visitor services manager whom we adore um, holding a horseshoe crab uh, you know, specimen. Uh, we had big conversations about what it was we were looking for um, when we went on this trip to take part in these specimens, um, knowing that our eyes would be bigger than our stomachs. Um, or that our eyes would be bigger than the like 0.5 shelf space that I have left in the collections room right now. Um, and so really thinking about what kinds of specimens we wanted to take home with us that were available to us that would really be a way um, to like be compelling. Um, Marisa, do you want to talk at all about that process for you or like what we kind of yeah. ended up deciding on? Yeah, we, we did have conversations ahead of time so that we wouldn't be um, tempted to branch out too far, but thinking about what our education collection could benefit from. Um, so what types of skulls maybe we um, uh, had, we didn't have quite enough of in our collection thus far, or um, things where maybe there were uh, many different examples of one type of specimen so that you can showcase um, variety, diversity, um, also things that are just a little bit puzzling. So getting into that cabinet of curiosity aspect of it, um, I believe that we got a fair amount of bacula from this collection, which um, uh, bacula are the bones of certain male mammals, uh, <laughs> I believe. Um, and then also, yeah, just thinking of deficits that we had within our collection, but also, you know, they had um, still there when we went to tour this house, um, just dozens and dozens and dozens of abalone shells. And we have partners with the Amamutsun Tribal Band who use abalone shells um, within their, um, their art and traditional practices. And so we were able to um, uh, gather those abalone shells from the Bandar collection, but also um, pass them along to the to the tribal band. Yeah, which was, uh, I thought, you know, that was something that occurred to Marisa, who's worked a lot um, on programming collaborations with Alma Munson. Um, and I was so glad that you like realized that as soon as you saw that box of abalone. Um, and then, yeah, so we, you know, some of the things, one of the things that we got, um, which is another part of the collections close up for this month, um, or the blog version was this turkey vulture skull. Um, I adore turkey vultures and I'm especially fascinated by sort of like this notion that, you know, people think that they're revolting um, because they eat dead things, but they're performing an essential ecological service by, you know, doing that and like ridding processing different, you know, um, waste products in the environment. Um, and so that bird and then a number of other, you know, skeleton specimens that we got from the band art collection were able to like engage the public uh, with our, you know, displays for Museum of the Macabre last year, which was the birds themed. So we ourselves are still figuring out ways to, you know, engage with this notion of, you know, the, um, the sort of spooky side of curiosity, like something that is maybe, you know, you don't, know what it is or you uh, it's like new to you or strange but um and maybe a little scary but nonetheless compelling and an opportunity to like open up different avenues of learning about the natural world and that brings us to 
Oh, and so there's still a lot of, you know, not just us, but a variety of other museums are still doing this kind of, you know, specimen dense, um, you know, encyclopedic displays um, that kind of capitalize on how compelling skeletons are, for example. Um, so this is the Museum of, Compar of Paleontology and Comparative Anatomy in Paris. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, a, a more like traditional sense of like using sort of skeletal, um, you know, articulated skeletons on display where you're just seeing a lot of like basic label information and just expansive display. Um, and then you have institutions like the Meter Museum who, you know, are really digging into, and Marisa can speak more to this, I think, maybe than I can because she's a big personal fan. Um, although I am too, of digging into this notion of like when, you know, collections are creepy. Um, how do you, you know, bridge the gap of that from that creepiness to a sense of excitement and learning? Yeah, yeah, I guess with the Muter Museum, I've never been to the Muter Museum, I'm dying to go, but I think what um, the fact that I'm so interested in them speaks to their ability to, um, I don't want to say capitalize off of this, this aesthetic um, trend of these curio cabinets, but really it does kind of, they do a really great job of hearkening back to um, this sort of like macabre nostalgia um, of a Victorian era in a way that seems so mission aligned, which I really um, appreciate about them. And, uh, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what we do currently at our museum that's also kind of like trying to, to nod to that now. Um, and as we've kind of gone back and forth with already today, um, our staff uh, kind of universally subscribes to this aesthetic, I believe, which makes um, collaborating on certain events um, and exhibits um, all the more easy. Um, and I think that uh, that might have something to do with, you know, the people who are drawn to natural history museums um, and natural history museums themselves, there is something very nostalgic about it with natural history museums and history museums, you are um, largely looking back to the past. And so, you know, that may be also why you members of our natural history museum um, are compelled to be with us tonight to learn about this. Um, and so we are definitely uh, interested in this aesthetic theme. Um, and we are interested in the aesthetics as an industry that does engage people um, visually, but there are a lot of things that we have to think about when we're making aesthetic decisions that are also um, mission aligned. Um, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit and also just talk about this concept of curiosity. So curiosity is something that I think about every single day that I work for the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And um, we speak about it a lot when thinking of our founder, Laura Hecox, who we're seeing here, tied pooling in a petticoat. Um, and for most of you, I'm sure you know our origin story of Laura growing up in Santa Cruz, exploring the tide pools of West Cliff Drive, um, collecting odd bits here and there, and just being delighted by the natural world around her to the point where she um, you know, maybe became obsessive, like <laughs> a lot of us are um, in, in gathering and understanding and looking more closely to the point where she actually um, created a natural history museum. And um, we so appreciate the foundation of curiosity that she gives us. And every time we work with students, um, we like to think about how those students are, you know, the next generation of Laura Hecox's. All of them have the capacity to leave, um, to, to be hyper curious about the natural world and to also leave a lasting and positive impact on their communities um, and their environment. And so um, we like to really harness curiosity as a major part of what we do. Our mission is connecting people with nature and science to inspire stewardship of the natural world. And we believe that it starts with that connection. Um, and so uh, just a little bit about our strategic plan, the word curiosity is in there. Um, it's a huge part of what we do. Our vision statement is to be a valued community resource and leader in science education, cultivating curiosity and appreciation and stewardship of nature. And the way that we do that is through our collections, exhibits, programs, and um, community. And you also see curiosity come up again in one of these. Uh, it's so small on my screen. Build community around a shared curiosity for an appreciation of the natural environment. So when we think about these offerings, about how we're going to share collections 
with the community, how we're going to communicate with our exhibits, what types of programs we're going to lead. We um, often think about what people are going to be curious about as a way of engaging them. Um, and that also is within our school programs, um, part of our pedagogy. Um, we do inquiry based learning and um, with the next generation science standards and with what we do when we're creating our curricula, we often start with something called an anchoring phenomenon. So this is very jargony and getting in the weeds a little bit, but it's like it's rooted in everything we do. And an anchoring phenomenon is really something that makes you go, huh, and makes you wonder about, you know, what's next. It's something that draws you in enough to want to explore it further. And it's something that doesn't have a clear answer right off the get go. Um, and so that's a great way to build our lessons for students. Um, and it's also kind of at the heart of when we're thinking of how to engage our community to through exhibits and programming. And just another aspect of our education, we also follow the 5E learning model, um, which is engage, explore, explain, elaborate, evaluate. Kathleen, if you want to show that one too. And it starts with engage, um, which is another form of just like hooking someone, um, tapping into their curiosity so that they feel compelled to go further. So just wanted to share that um, the curiosity is at the root of what we do. Um, in addition to when we um, get into things like Museum of the Macabre. So Museum of the Macabre serves several areas for us. And if you've been to the Museum of the Macabre event in the past, please let us know your favorite part about it in the comments so we can talk about it because we love talking about Museum of the Macabre so much. Um, and what this event does for us is it allows us to bring in um, a new audience through uh, it's sort of like we're turning the museum into a curiosity cabinet of specimen rich displays, you know, coupled with mood lighting and cocktails and costumes. Um, and it's very much in line with a movement in museum cultures to create immersive exhibits driven by sensory exploration. Um, and it's an aesthetic decision to use, um, you know, overstimulation as a, as a mode of engagement. So that's what we're doing with this event. And it is kind of an event that is very easy to blur the lines between um, someone used in the chat earlier that uh, um, something we were referring to was very much like clickbait of the 1700s. And like, that is something that you risk um, with trying to engage new audiences and, um, you know, throw parties at a museum is, are you doing it for your mission or are you doing it um, to, to get people in? Um, and to get like to sell tickets. Although and I do just want to chime in really quick, Marisa, and and say that I think one of the most interesting things about digging into this curiosity cabinet history, which I've always been a fan of, is just really seeing how much like the origins of the museums were basically just people partying about informational objects um, and like touching and engaging and smelling and all sorts of things. So like it that. all comes full circle. That's really what we're doing here. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we are bringing in uh, new audiences and people in surprising ways. Um, someone also brought up in the, in the chat um, concern over uh, Victorian ladies' petticoats knocking over all of these touch displays in the cabinet, uh, curiosity cabinet, natural history displays. And that was also a concern with some of the costumes that have come into our museum for this event. Um, but it does allow us to um, bring in new people to explore our permanent exhibits, as you see in the next um, image. Uh, these are, you know, we didn't create this display that they're looking at here, which is our reptile case for this event. We brought them into the museum for the event and then they were able to, to explore this display. But we also put on um, our own special exhibits for this event where we're able to bring out objects from our collection as well as um, borrow objects from other partner organizations um, to tell rich, deep stories. Um, and so again, while these people are coming in to engage with the museum for this event, for this party, they're also engaging with natural history um, through these exhibits and programs that we're putting on. Um, and 
when, again, when you are creating an event that's very much driven by aesthetics, you can see we have decorations everywhere, mood lighting, um, drinks and costumes and all these things. You do risk um, encroaching too much on the decoration side and leaving interpretation behind that tension between education and spectacle. And um, this image, these are uh, loaned specimens that we had for um, this image is from the second year of Museum of the Macabre in 2017 where the theme was bones and we turned um, one area of the museum into an osteology cabinet really. Um, and these objects are on loan from a collector who also exhibited with us the previous year. And the previous year we had these same specimens, but um, we didn't interpret them super fully because really our focus was creating this cabinet of curiosity in the museum. And over the years, as we've continued to, um, to get better at doing this, um, we've added on additional layers of interpretation and education and rethought um, of some of the, these fine line areas and made sure that we're not just creating a spectacle, that we're also creating interpretive moments. Um, and that came down to our photo booth as well, another favorite aspect of this event. Um, on the left is an image from one of our, I think our earliest year of Museum of the Macabre, um, which uh, we have a lot of objects in our collections that are part of our education collection. And these specimens are objects that um, we are um, more able to bring out to community events that we may have students touch in um, in a school program, for instance, they're meant to be a little bit more tactile than some of our other objects. And so for this early year, we decided, okay, we'll, we'll put these objects out um, to be engaged with in the photo booth. And you can see that it um, elicits, you know, certain interactions with these specimens, which as someone said in the chat, you know, we need to have respect for the specimens. And over the years, we've also begun to realize that with an event like this, because those lines are so blurred, we need to do a really good job of making sure that we're setting um, our specimens up for success. And so um, in future iterations, we didn't make specimens props in the same way um, as, a, as a specific call to me. If it's gonna be a specimen on display in one of our exhibits, whether it's for the Museum of the Macabre or not, it's going to be something that serves an educational value and is not spectacle or clickbait, um, like we said. Um, another decision that we had to make is like how to display specimens. So again, part of this whole movement we're talking about has to do with aesthetics. And so we are trying to artfully display our specimens. We are trying to, um, to engage people's sensibilities, curiosities, to draw people in with this rich sensory overload experience. But we also are doing so with specimens, which we respect. And so this was a decision where we went back and forth on, um, on how to display these specimens in a way that we wanted it to be artful, but we also wanted to, to be clear that we were respecting them. And so we hope that that didn't come across. And finally, one other aspect that I wanted to talk about of like the difficulties of engaging with the macabre um, is that it's macabre. <laughs> and macabre refers to kind of like a ghastly, gruesome, ghoulish um, nod to death and, you know, morbidity and mortality. And, um, and it can be unsettling and it draws you in, but sometimes it draws you in in a way that makes you want to turn away. Um, and so kind of, you know, deciding what to do with that. Um, we had a lot of conversations about the image on the right, um, which is, yeah. This was one of my favorite um, Museum of the Macabre related discussions centered around uh, Marisa designing this flyer and being like, guys, is this too gross? <laughs> is this too upsetting? And we were like, we know that like we're like as a community, this workplace is like very into the spooky um, and sort of like maybe, you know, like, like unfiltered aspects of the natural world and then how to decide, you know, okay, well, if people are going to come here, there's going to be live taxidermy. So they have to be ready for it. So we could put it on the poster, but it's a pretty graphic image to put on the poster and like the steps that you took to like try to tone down the graphicness while still using it as part of the allure because that was honest to the nature of the event. Yeah, and that's the same with, with the, the um, primate on the right. We had originally thought like, we'll share this as like a social media image in advance. 
and determined that like people aren't consenting to seeing this when they're scrolling through their Instagram feed. If they register for the event and we do a good job of like being clear of what you're going to get when you get there, then that's okay. So we had it on display. Um, but, but yeah, that, that line of, um, of how and when to share the macabre and with this, with this poster, yeah, there was, there were birds that were being dissected right in front of your face when you came. And we wanted that to be clear too. Um, for the people who are registering. So we, we tried to be as explicit as possible of what you're going to get. Um, but so we, I think that this poster worked out <laughs> um, fine, but yeah, so uh, that's some of the ways that we still engage with this aesthetic and with, um, uh, with the idea of curiosity cabinets in the museum today. And um, we did have a couple of questions for you. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, so, also, um, like I said, we are still doing the Museum of the Macabre, um, even if we're not having an event necessarily um, live in person at the museum, we're having a series of events that do nod to this. Um, so starting with today, but also um, if you do wanna learn the basics of tax taxidermy, we're gonna have a webinar on the 27th um, and we're being explicit about warning for the squeamish. Um, we will be demonstrating on an acorn woodpecker. And then also, um, our macabre mushrooms talk that's coming up too. That one is really nodding to this um, uh, desire to engage with the curious aspects of nature. We're going to be highlighting actual natural phenomena, um, but that are somewhat macabre and using that as a way to um, explore biodiversity. So yes, it's rooted in this um, this sort of like this thing that tugs at you and off puts you off balance um, and is maybe aesthetically startling, but it's also um, something that has uh, a lot of um, rich opportunities to engage with the natural world. So. Yeah. And um, we did have one question for you, Kathleen, that I wanted to make sure we got to because it's about the hairball. Yeah, there's, I see there's actually like a couple questions. Um, sorry guys for not keeping up with the questions in the chat, but I'm not seeing the hairball one. Can you read How that big is the hairball? Oh, it's about the size of my face. Um, it <laughs> is pleasantly, um, like softly dense. Um, and the thing that I really liked about it is there's like sort of one nick in the surface where you can see that it's all of these hairs that slowly like coagulated in one of the stomachs of the cow. And then on the exterior got like smoothed over and smoothed over. Um, kind of like how like pearls like are made from the smoothing over of like an irritant, but um, the hairballs in a cow can like actually, they can get big enough that they can cause problems like death. Um, I also saw, um, yeah, so Ray Bandar collected hundreds of California um, sea lion skulls and is, there's a, a wall of 400 of them at the California Academy of Sciences. If you guys check out the blog, there's a bunch of links to their resources about like learning from skulls and like how they, they process their specimens um, and stuff that like Ray collected and himself talked about. Um, and then another, you guys are having a lot of fun in this chat. Um, another comment I saw was Mr. Wilson's Cabinet of Wonders, which I have read. It is incredible. I've also been to the Museum of, the Jura of Jurassic Technology. Um, and for any of those who, you, who are sort of interested in this history, it's definitely like a museum of museums um, and looking at like how things are like ordered. Um, there's an exhibit about a bat that allegedly can go through physical surfaces through its echolocation powers. Love that one. Um, do we have other questions? Not that I've noticed in here. Um, I have a question for you since you're so um, like tapped into this, um, to this world. What are some of your other favorite like modern examples that you think um, connect to this aesthetic value or modern forms of cabinets? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, there's a lot of um, I think one of the things that I, that might not be considered like a cabinet of curiosities in the sense of like explicitly calling back to this like old like wood and glass aesthetic, um, but something that I think is a good example of like immersing someone in like a world of different kinds of specimens um, is this, uh, I forget the name off the top of my head right now, but it's in Europe and it's a um, micro 
like a microscopic specimen exhibit and so microscopic and so you like walk into a room where all of the walls are slides of um, microscopic specimens that are like lit from the back and then you're able to take like a magnifying glass and go up and look at them um, and they have all these different sort of arrangements of how they like relate to one another or like relate to different collectors. Um, and that one I think is like especially fun because you can think about like how big of a difference it was to look about, look at and think about the ordering of the natural world um, before we even like now it's like, oh yeah, microscopic things. You don't always see them in museums. You kind of forget about them maybe when you're in a natural history museum, but there was like a time period where we were like, oh heck, we don't even know these things exist at all. Um, and so I really like that like way of like giving so much space to like a, a type Something of specimen simple. that oftentimes you don't see. Yeah. And also like that, um, that uh, aspect of cabinets that often is um, just like the immense quantity is sometimes a quality of um, of this method of display, just like this like overstimulation um, side of things, which I like. Um, there was another part of what you're just saying that I wanted to ask you about, but it left me. Um, yeah. And we like love these things. So if any of you guys in the chat have like other examples, like I know the Museum of Jurassic Technology is great. Um, last year at the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History um, did like a natural history of horror exhibit that they still have some resources for. So that's sort of like taking us into like the um, like creepier side, the spookier, the creepier side of curiosity. Yeah, well, and I love that too, um, what you've been talking about, like how you've chosen to organize these objects and how you can organize them in a different context to tell a different story. And that's the case with, um, with everything that we engage with when we, when we enter into the world of the macabre um, and even, you know, the Nat doing history of, natural history of horror. Um, you know, it's aspects of the natural world that you can engage with in lots of different ways, but by framing it um, in, this, in this way, it may connect in a more culturally relevant way for certain people. And that's kind of like a large part of what we do is like reorganizing things, um, telling a different story, looking at things from different angles to, um, to reach, reach as many people as possible because not every story is gonna resonate with every person. Um, and there are some people like you and me and maybe a lot of the people who are joining us today who like this is the type of stuff that resonates. And so it's a great way to um, to get people to learn about osteology or to learn about um, what are some other things, a bird anatomy. Like people came to the Museum of the Macabre that was the taxidermy themed, probably in large part to like see taxidermy in action. But what they got was they learned about bird anatomy. They probably didn't think they were going to get that. Yeah, and on the subject of anatomy, um, so the Moss Landing Marine Lab, um, I've never made it to one of their open houses, but we are talking to some folks there. We were recently transferred um, a couple of sea otter skeletons that have not been articulated yet. Um, and Moss Landing Marine Lab boasts one of the biggest collections of sea otter skeletons, seven sea otter skeletons in the world. Um, and we're hoping to work with some of their grad students to get them articulated. This is a dream. It's early <laughs> in, its, in its life story, but um, I think that would be really cool. They have a lot of really amazing things. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the question about digital collections is I think a really interesting question. Um, and the thing that I find most striking in like this, you know, um, theme that we're looking at right now as it relates to that is the notion of arrangement. Um, and so oftentimes we think about arrangement, especially for specimens, you know, it's like rooted in the physical world and how we're really like uh, walking people through things or like placing things or demonstrating like their evolutionary relationships or things like that. And for digital collections, um, there's, you're not bound by any notion of physical space. So you can make all sorts of links and arrangements you know, through like, for example, like a really like well-designed database to different kinds of parts of the collection. So I hope that we can take, um, as we're digitizing things, I hope we can take our collection in that direction as well. Absolutely. Hard at work getting, getting in that direction. Um, we uh, done gone, gone over uh, <laughs> <laughs> as anticipated. Um, so I think we will um, bid you all adieu for now, but again, happy October, and we hope you'll join us for other macabre events to come. Um, and we'll send out a survey link and an email um, shortly, as well as a resource list that um, Kathleen has put together where you can dive into some of those topics that we weren't able to really explore today, specifically like decolonizing museums and um, 
uh, you know, the colonial history of, of cabinets to um, which we encourage you to dig into more. Anything else you want to share, Kathleen? Uh, no, that's all. Thank you guys so much for hanging out and talking to us about this. I am sure that I got very excited um, and, you know, bounced around a lot, um, you know, in the sort of eclectic, uh, you know, odd way that befits a curiosity <laughs> cabinet. So thank you for hanging out. And, and I'm glad uh, y'all enjoyed yourselves. Uh, and we'll see <laughs> yeah. you next time. And uh, yeah. maybe uh, after you leave this webinar, start exploring your house and see what's the most curious things you have and start creating your own little displays, um, make your own little cabinet shrine. That's what both Kathleen and I will probably be doing. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll see you next time, guys. Thanks for joining us.